Okay. Am I on? Of course not. Yes, I am. I am. I'm on. Stand up. Come on, stand up. I am. I, I just think it's important that we realize we get to stand in this time and season. The future is now becoming history, and we are making history, and we are a part of God's prediction of that future. We are blessed to be a part of that. April 13th was not just a, a, a show of three to 4,000 people on the Capitol campus once again, which is unprecedented in our state alone, but we did it in 50 states united in prayer together. We did that, and we are beginning to see the fashioning of the unity of the body of Christ together. This is something that I believe has been lost. We call it denominations territorialism. We have lost sight of how to love and be together, arm to arm, brother to brother, serving the kingdom of God and his advancement with purpose. And I loved yesterday, we had so many expressions of faith come together with one message. And as Lord, we repent. We repent for our actions. We repent for what we have not done and what we have done. And we say, Lord, today, with the hashtag, because that's a new heavenly thing, don't mess with our kids, right? God is using hashtags. He just holds them up in heaven's throne. I'm just amazed that God continues to work in and through us. We were blessed to be a part of that together. But the reason why I asked you to stand is because I don't wanna be sitting down in what's taking place. I don't wanna, you know, there were kings in the past who literally sat and said, well, it's not gonna affect me, so I don't really care what's gonna happen to the next generation. But Josiah, he rose up and he said, not today, Lord. Let's raise up the standard. Let's open the word of God. Let's begin to take down the idols and let's begin again towards the advancement of the kingdom of God. You can be seated now. Just know that we are standing today together. And what I, uh, I think it's inappropriate not to mention that we are also, after last week, I shared with you, we don't want to listen to the YouTube prophets, but we do want to read the, effectively what the Word of God says. And there is things taking place right now, and it is the advancement for the kingdom of God that this is happening, okay? Right when we were in the midst of our prayer, even yesterday, Iran attacks Israel, and sends 200 plus drones and 500 plus missiles over the day. And you know what? I have it on good advice and intelligence that not a single one of those shots hit the ground. That's God. That's God. You know, not everybody knows this, and we call it the Iron Dome, and that thanks to the United States uh, leasing that back to Israel, but that's not what actually was used yesterday. What they call it is David's sling. And David slays his giants. And this is an amazing name. And that's the system that continues to be used. And I'm just, uh, I, I, I pray for the peace of Jerusalem. Yeah. We pray for the people in Israel. We pray for all innocent life yeah. today, that no one is lost to the advancement of the kingdom of God. We don't want souls headed to hell. We don't want war in this world. We know by prophecy it will take place. And right now it's unfolding before our eyes. Those things are full unfolding before our eyes like never before. But then let's look at the other side of things. God is on the move. He is moving a nation upon nation and he's bringing souls to the fold. And I pray that the Gentiles will come to fulfillment and that the return of Christ is imminent. And Maranatha, anybody know that word? Come quickly, Lord Jesus, come. But I've been growing in my own spirit because one thing I do not want to do is have my eyes outward and not let God show me what needs to change on the inside. Yeah. Anybody agree? Yeah. Today, I want to talk about keeping score. And if you haven't recognized, our world has an issue. Our world thinks that justice is the polar opposite of forgiveness. That either I seek justice or I offer forgiveness. I can't do both. And I wanna show you in the kingdom light, it is possible to do both, but I also wanna uncover potentially, as I've done in my life, that I'm a person that keeps score. I do not forgive people the way that God designed me to forgive. And it's important that we learn this, otherwise we create tragedy in our life, okay? We must lose count of offenses against us and freely forgive as God has forgiven us. Here's the problem. We're imperfect people, striving toward a perfect relationship. 
Is that not true? We kind of give ourselves uh, a recognition of our motive, but then we hold others in judgment based upon their action. And we recognize and give ourselves grace, but when we're in relation, we, we kind of judge and gauge how we react and relate to them based upon their interaction with us. And oftentimes, uh, how many can walk into a, a, the relationship with your spouse or a friend, sibling, and not remember the things that they've done and giving them a, a, a fresh canvas every day? Anybody? Anybody relate to that? Like you might hesitate to answer that phone because it has a certain name on it. And you're like, I don't really want to answer that right now. And it happens to be your spouse. I don't know. It just happens every once in a while. <laughs> Let me point out uh, some examples. Have you ever heard, even with the siblings in childhood, roommates, spouses, somebody that's in the room that might be next to you, it's your turn to fill in the blank, do the dishes, mow the lawn. Why don't you do something? Why don't you get up and do something? Uh, we hear this a lot. I did that last time. We're keeping score, right? Young Sally's in the back of the car. Johnny hit me. And Johnny faithfully says, but she hit me first. We're one for one. We're good. <laughs> Parents just decide, we don't have to do anything then. You guys are even in your score. My favorite, I put the kids to bed last time. Will you please get up and help me? I have never heard that in my life. I'm a righteous man. I, I just know in, with, in tune to the spirit when it's necessary. Simple comments that strike memory, but also emotions. You see, I can make fun of these things, but they betrayed me. We have had abuse, misconduct. You know, in, in the past years, it was easier for somebody that was alcoholic or dealing with addiction in that way, but sexual sin... That's deviant altogether in a different way. But the church has, in the 60s, they're just like almost forcing people to, what, what does forgiveness look like? And it was just keep it silent, repress. Keep it on the down. Stay with that husband, even if he's unfaithful. Stay with that husband, even if he's abusive. Because we had a lack of understanding of the definition of forgiveness. And I think, honestly, if you've ever been in that situation where that which was given to you as forgiveness was defined poorly, then as a body of Christ, as the person that represents what Christ offers, I apologize. God has a way better way to help release you and honor the forgiveness that is needed. I would like to say too, one of the focus key points is that if you enact keeping a score with the way you hold people to account or let them off the hook, that you don't have a different person that relates to God. You're not a different, well, me and him are, we're different. I hold everybody else by their action. I hold unforgiveness in my heart, but yet you'll find that with God, what has he done for me lately? He can't expect me to do that. He can't expect me to honor what his word says. He doesn't understand what I'm going through. We begin to make these internal dwelling ideas and we build these uh, defenses against God's plan for our life, that which gives freedom. He has never given to us anything that was purposed under heaven that harms. It may be hard. And that's one of the things that I wanna really focus on today. When we talk about forgiveness, we kind of make it, yeah, just forgive them. Sounds sweet, right? Well, I think it's a hard thing to do. I think it's hard work to forgive. I think that's why God requires it of us. He honors us with what he gives in its stead, but forgiveness is a very hard process, especially those that have been offended at great levels. So let's read our Bible passage to get together. I love the word of God, and it's in Matthew 18, 21 through 35 today. It's an interesting passage. Give you a moment to get there because we all brought our Bibles today, right? <laughs> and when you pop out your phone and say, yep, that's all good. <laughs> today, Matthew 18, 21. Then Peter came up and said to him, Lord, how often will my brother sin against me and I forgive him? As many as seven times. You see, it was in Jewish culture, something of value, that three times that you would come to them. But seven, that's a great number. That's a sign of completion. Hey, Peter's doing a little bit above and beyond. 
Jesus said to him, I do not say to you seven times, but 77 times, 70 times seven. Therefore, the kingdom of heaven may be compared to a king who wished to settle accounts with his servants. When he began to settle, one was brought to him who owed him 10,000 talents. We've talked about this before, but if you need a reference to that, that's in today's society, that is the wealth beyond wealth. That is a debt beyond debt. That's a debt beyond a lifetime that can be accomplished. Verse 25, and since he could not pay his master, ordered him to be sold with his wife, his children, and all that he had and payment to be made. So the servant, he fell on his knees, imploring him, have patience with me and I will pay you everything. This is obviously not possible, but I'm sorry. And out of pity for him, the master of that servant released him and forgave him of that debt. But when that same servant went out, he found one of his fellow servants who owed him a hundred denarii, a week's worth of wage. And seizing him, he began to choke him saying, pay what you owe. So his fellow servant fell down and pleaded with him, have patience with me, or I'm sorry, and I'll pay you. He refused. And he went and put him in prison until he should pay that debt. Hold that man accountable. When his fellow servants saw what had taken place, they were greatly distressed, I believe even confused. And they went and reported to their master all that had taken place. Then his master summoned him and said to him, you wicked servant, I forgave you all that debt because you had pleaded with me. And should not you have had mercy on your fellow servant as I had mercy on you? And in anger, his master delivered him to the jailers until he should pay all his debt, obviously greater. So also my heavenly father will do to every one of you if you do not forgive your brother from your heart. This is the warning. I wanna know how to forgive because he says so clearly in his word, that if we do not have forgiveness, then our Father in heaven will not forgive us. This seems like a key component that we need to take into consideration. Luke 7 has a very similar you know, uh, story. And there's in Matthew also, you'll see that if you are going to give or going into worship and you have ought against your brother, that you are to go make it right. So we have these two complementing each other in scripture that we need to have forgiveness in our heart. We need to internally inspect, be looking at what's there, what offense is there and make it right. Why? Because God requires it for us to be in right relationship with him. This is important to know. Our frame of mind when you're in a continued relationship, do you think of how the person made you feel that day, (coughs) that week, how they're making you feel and you're holding things? like a debtor, family spouses, siblings, friends, coworkers. I mean, there are people that I worked with that I'm still working on forgiveness and it was 20 years ago, it seemed like, for what they did. I'm like, Lord, let that forgiveness sink into my heart. I may have a little bit of issues that are con- contriving and pushing and I may be angry, but Lord, I need forgiveness to be in my heart today. I wanna see which side of this you fall on. Some people are quick to forgive, but never confront. Maybe you're on the other side. You love to confront, but you have a really hard time forgiving. Or maybe you're just a self-righteous progressive and you stand in the middle, I don't know, (laughs) who knows. Confrontation though is an interesting thing. Because what I'm talking about, if I use two other words, is forgiveness and justice. True forgiveness retains justice. Let's talk about the cross. Christ goes to the cross for the penalty of what is owed. As we heard yesterday, for those that were there, he overpaid what was owed. But he did it. And in that process, he said, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. He looked at the actions of the people and instead of just making a propitiation for our sins to appease the wrath of God, 
He also points in reflection and says to these people, you and me, forgive them for they don't know what they're doing. They don't know they're killing the son of God. They don't know or they have denied that that's what they're doing. And even those that could acknowledge or would acknowledge, they crucified him, placed him on a cross. And it's the cleansing blood of God that brings justice, not you or me. That's keeping score. It's the cleansing blood of God that allows forgiveness, true forgiveness, an internal work. And I believe that if we will allow for our hearts to be in the right place, we come internally, introspectively and allow forgiveness so that we can confront. If we choose not to forgive, it is a warning as we cannot see that which births wrath in our heart. You see, when you don't forgive, does not something stir in you towards an anger that manifests in an altogether different way? I confess it becomes something, and how many have watched Lord of the Rings? You don't have to admit it, we're in church. Sorry, <laughs> Sorry don't ask. But that wrath turns into a wraith. It's a, 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 kind of that soulless wanderer. Your wrath becomes something that controls your mind and all your destiny is built on is the past that is unforgiven. It holds us bound, it anchors us to that. So that wrath manifests in us and it becomes, it, it transforms slowly into a restless mind controlled and enslaved to the offenses of your past. There's an old film called Calvary, an Irish priest named Father James is told that he will be murdered in seven days during a confession behind the box, but the unknown person giving that confession. And throughout the movie, Father James, he battles his desires to hate those in his church, to flee for his life, and to give it all into despair. And yet in the end, he decides to stay and face this person who had threatened his life to offer grace and love. In a conversation with his daughter uh, during the movie, before the encounter, he says, I think there's too much talk about sin and not enough about virtue. His daughter replies, what would be your number one? He answers, I think forgiveness has been highly underrated. And through the movie, he begins to progress towards the idea of forgiving that which was about to happen. While Christians acknowledge the forgiveness of sins through the cross, the extension of grace and forgiveness to others in community is not often granted. In this scriptural passage, we understand that the gravity of God's forgiveness towards believers and the importance of forgiving others in order to fully live in God's grace. We cannot allow or think that we have the substance of God's forgiveness in our heart if we cannot honor it as an expression through our lives. That's what he's saying. I don't think it's God's like, I'll turn your back because yeah, you, you had that little spat and you didn't take care of it. That's not what he's talking about. He's saying, I did all this work. And if you have that work accomplished in your life, it's gonna show through. It's gonna show through. That forgiveness is gonna be, although hard work, it's gonna be something that's visible through your life. Within ancient Jewish context, extending forgiveness three times, like I said, was sufficient to show a gracious spirit. When Peter comes to Jesus with that number, seven, I think he was trying to be very generous, arrogant. And at least from a human perspective, the number seven, as we know, isn't arbitrary. It could be a direct relation to Lamech's, uh, Lamech's boast. If you look in Genesis 4, 24, if you wanna go there really quick, it says, if Cain shall be avenged sevenfold, then Lamech 77fold. So he's taking something out of the text of scripture. And he's like, hey, I actually know something. Although I'm a fisherman, I remember one thing from my childhood and he brings it to attention. 70 times seven is why I believe God unfolds that as it's mentioned. Christ effectively takes off all limitations on forgiveness. We are to forgive not seven times, but 70 times seven times. Just continue to allow forgiveness as an expression to roll through you. Does this change the heart of anger? I don't believe so. On many occasions until fully released, we call that reconciliation. We oftentimes get the two mixed up. And if you're an accountant, you kind of understand the word redemption. You kind of understand the word reconciliation. And in conversation with my daughter, although eight, as we were talking, I said, some things reconcile at a loss. Some things actually are a loss and they don't come back to zero. Sometimes that can frustrate us and make us angry. Some things have been taken away that won't be given back. 
Certainly not. Jesus demonstrates the forgiveness that he offers has no limitation. Do you put limits on God's forgiveness towards others? No, but if they... Maybe these examples will help you define what kind of forgiveness you might have pattern to offer as we look into our own personal character today. I look at this as semi-pragmatic, if you, uh, in reality. Let's call it first one, therapeutic. Therapeutic forgiveness. You realize it's not healthy to stay mad or angry anymore. You let it go. This is, uh, even the world sometimes like, I can't stay mad because it's just, it's just affecting me. You know, in some ways we thought this is good. Would you agree with that? Mm -hmm. Just let it go because it's hurting you. However, if we look at the justice that was accomplished on the cross, Christ, where was his focus? On himself or on the other? If we are offended, we're not looking for therapy here. It's hard work, but we are caring about the other individual being restored. Our confrontation isn't to make them pay. Our confrontation isn't to get them to agree. Our confrontation is to restore. Our desire is to restore them. Oftentimes we get to that area though. It's like, let's just, it's pragmatic in a sense. It's just, it fulfills the, the, the simple needs and says, for self, I need to let this go so that I can move on. But then it's unaddressed and it just rests in the heart. It rests in the soul. Number two, this is my favorite, probably the one I apply in my life the most, and we'll call it merited transactional. You see, forgiveness is a covenant act, but transactional contracts are built on merit. So a basis of repayment or a demand, I'm gonna hold a grudge until you grovel enough. I'm gonna hold a grudge and make everybody know until you feel the shame that I feel or the betrayal that I felt. You can even downgrade it to, well, if they undid my bed, I'm gonna undo theirs. Or if they wear my nice sweater, just because they're younger doesn't give them the opportunity, so I'm gonna take theirs. And you know, it, we just play the sibling rivalries. We, we operate in this tit for tat contract over and over. And when somebody does something against us, we make them pay. And some of us have an easier road up that meritable path. We can merit that transaction and you know what, I'm gonna give you forgiveness. All you have to do is these small things. And others, it's a, it's a hill to climb like Everest. And it's, oh, if you can go tell everybody what you did, then yes. And then once they do that, come back. And now that you've told everyone, now I want you to, and it just never ends. Because forgiveness is not in the heart. That forgiveness comes from Christ Jesus from the start. That's where it originates. And that's why we call it God's forgiveness. This is different. A voluntary suffering. That's what forgiveness is. Living sacrifice that forgives and seeks to redeem or reconcile when possible. Forgiveness is always a form of voluntary suffering to bring about the greater good. We oftentimes don't understand this because we are set in our hearts, in our minds, in this place internally with offense. The left has it really well adapted versus the right. The right kind of has this idea of winsome kindness and it's gonna win everybody over and we try to approach that and be this forgiving nature in, in advance of things happening and it doesn't work really well. On the other side, on the left, we have this always angry. You've gotta be angry. And if you're angry, you can hold on to this and then it gives us that power and then just to move things forward and continue to move the needle towards what we want. And because... Left or right isn't a representation of politics. It's a representation, as Ecclesiastes says, of the heart and mankind. Humankind, a uh, fool leans to the left and the right is righteous. But what it's really representing here is a bit different because we don't quite tangibly understand what God is trying to in, in give us in this encounter. Are you willing to voluntarily suffer without choice. See, this is after the fact, not before. Christ endured the cross for the hope set before him, but he chose that path. 
The things that happen to you, you don't choose. For many are innocent as young children who have been violated, hurt, abused. For some of us, we enter in with our eyes what we thought were wide open, but deception has taken place. And we understand who that individual is. And then we find ourselves disillusioned. We have these realities that become unfolding in front of us. We think ourselves better than we ought. We think others better than we should. But then unforgiveness enters your heart. So now we pattern a defense against anybody that has any uh, a hint or that I could define as the same action. And so we just continue to push people away. But this is where God's forgiveness, a voluntary suffering that says before it happens or even after it happens. Lord, this offense, I'm just gonna release it to you. I didn't want it to happen, but I know I don't wanna carry it. It angers me that this happened. It angers me that other people are affected. It angers me that these are the things that we have to go through in this fallen world, but I'm gonna give it to you because forgiveness is a release. It's a surrender. It's a sacrifice. It's a living sacrifice. And it's, God, I don't know what I would do with this, but I know that you will do better with it than I can. So I choose to forgive. I choose to forgive when people have betrayed me. I choose to forgive when people wrong me. I choose to forgive when people do things against me. And then I realize, Lord, they aren't rejecting me, they're rejecting you because I'm the image of you and I want that to be what people see. And so instead of looking at how the offense is on me, Lord, I just put it on the cross where it belongs. And I say, thank you for your forgiveness. Thank you for your justice because that justice was paid for. Obviously, he understands the atrocities of life. Obviously, he can account for those things because he was there in the very moment as fully human, fully God, betrayed by all of mankind. As the father turned and looked away and he became sin who knew no sin, that we can become the righteousness of God. He paid a debt that no lifetime could pay. He overpaid for that debt. And you and I have this opportunity to allow for that forgiveness to come into our hearts. That's where I wanna start right here. You may be thinking of an offense that you've been carrying for a long time. You may be thinking of somebody that has betrayed you or hurt you or offended you. You may be thinking that you've been patterned like this, defense against everyone that tries to be in relationship with you because of how many times you've been hurt in innocence before as a child. But God has a way forward today. And it starts in the internal. God will bring justice. Take not revenge for vengeance is mine, say the Lord. No more tit for tat, no more merited transactions for forgiveness. Don't waste your time or exhaust another and confront where necessary. Confront with the truth, but confront after forgiveness is in the heart. If you open with me to Job 33, 21 through 30. I'll even start in verse 24. Then he is gracious to him. And I say, deliver him from going down to that pit. I have found a ransom. His flesh shall be young like a child's. He shall return to the days of his youth. He shall pray to God and he will delight in him. He shall see his face with joy for he restores to man his righteousness. Then he looks at men and says, I have sinned and have perverted what was right and it did not profit me. This is that heart of repentance. Forgive me, Lord. He will redeem his soul from going down to the pit once again and his life shall see the light. Behold, God works all things twice. No, in fact, three times for man. It's just this constant. God honors forgiveness over and over and over again as we fail, though a righteous man, 24, 16 in Proverbs, for a righteous man may fall seven times and rise again. But I will tell you, the wicked shall fall into calamity and they stay there. The foolish does not have forgiveness in their heart because they don't recognize how it holds us bound. We are enslaved to unforgiveness. We are enslaved to the anchoring ourselves to the past, filtering out our heart, and we are then deceived. I've been doing a little bit of studying 
beyond the word of God, more into the science of the mind, beginning to realize that there is a very thin line that stands between repression and deceit. See, repression is like during a process of trauma, we repress memory. We look away from our scraped knee for a moment and all of a sudden it feels better. That's a repressive emotion. It's a repressive thought. But then if we are unwilling to go and process and address and deal with the truth, it becomes deception. So what I began to realize is that many people, it begins with a process of emotion that rises and repression that stops it. But then when we begin to not process or deal with that, it becomes our own truth and we begin to believe a lie. Sadly, some of us in this room have gotten caught up in a pattern of living a lie. It starts with a moment, an event, then it becomes a process and our mind begins to change how we pattern. And then from that pattern, we begin to live out deceptive. And then we ourselves become deceitful because we can't filter between these things. So to the repressed heart, repressed mind, to the repression of past, it becomes something that really holds us bound because when we are unwilling to deal with the hard and hurtful things in our life, allowing God to honor and live in those moments and honor the forgiveness that he gives where we can find true release, we begin to carry that burden and it begins to weigh on us and we begin to filter with our eyes and believe in our mind differently than what the truth of God says. That's what happens. This is how our humanity and flesh works. But why, that is why I believe Corinthians says so clearly that we are not to hold thoughts captive, but we are bring, to bring them into captivity. We're to pull them down, those strongholds and those areas, so that, and our weapon is not, it's mighty through prayer. So we're not, we're not trying to fix things. We're just bringing it before the Lord and saying, Lord, I surrender this. This place that you have held it captive for me, these mindsets that I have, these patterns of thoughts that I have, these ill and evil thoughts that are in me, I give them to you. I don't know what to do with them. And if they stay in me, they're just gonna make a toxic mess of me. And I'm gonna live out a life that I don't really want. And then I'm gonna be the one apologizing instead of just demanding for forgiveness. I'm gonna be the one having to honor it. So that's the difference. There may be some discomfort with the notion of the father's judgment on Christians, possibly even a misunderstanding when we do not forgive others. Doesn't God forgive no matter the offense? He does forgive, but in his forgiveness, he calls his followers to do the same. This is not in any sense a secondary calling. As the father has let go of the massive offense that was committed against him and the atrocity against his son, and due to our sin, so we are called to let go of the offenses committed against us In other words, our forgiveness of others is rooted in God's grace and mercy. That's where the resource is. You cannot, by merit, wait till your emotions change and hold you down. Pray for the ability to forgive those who have wronged you when safe to do so. See, I also wanna bring up that there are times that there are circumstances that are an unsafe environment and there's no reconciliation. Forgiveness is the requirement of God, not reconciliation. Reconciliation means bringing things back to the way they were. That doesn't always happen, does it? There are many relationships that are not broken in my eyes, but are not connected in the way they were. And that's acceptable. And so to demand reconciliation is both parties have to be willing to accept to bring things back by the mercy and grace of God. I believe we should make every effort to be at peace with those around us, as God says, to the best of our ability, as his word says. I'm just gonna tell you, forgiveness is granted before it's emotionally felt. It's an act of sacrifice and a promise in a relationship. And I'm gonna give you three practical reminders. And this is something I'm learning. This is something that I'm trying to apply. Number one, if I'm really forgiving and I'm making that promise first, promise not to throw it back in their face. Quit bringing it up. I have heard this, and I'm just gonna say it because it needs to be said in my eyes, this idea that uh, to the 
perpetrator. They need to just put up with it. And anytime that somebody brings it back to attention that's been offended or victim by that, that there's this need that they need to bring it up and they need to just say apology. And again, I think there's merit behind that. But listen to that merit transaction. I'm talking to the person that's dealing with this personally. I'm telling you, overcome that need because there's more healing when you can overcome and not continue to throw back in the face the offense or the discredit, the betrayal or the the hardship that you endured. Voluntary sacrifice. I'm just willing God to give it to you right now because it will heal the heart. Sure, you can process through this, but I'm gonna tell you, if you're chasing for an emotion to feel better about what somebody did wrong to you, you'll never find it. You'll never find it. If you wanna all of a sudden feel better about what they did to you, it'll not come because you still have an enemy and you have humanity working against you at all times. The only way that that's gonna change is a miracle and you're headed the wrong way. If you're trying to wait for the emotion and feeling to change in your heart, but the spirit of God, let me tell you, he can change your heart, even when you're angry. Throughout these promises of forgiveness, the promise that you make to God so that you can grow, he will change your heart. That's the resource. He can work in you. Just, you can be angry, but sin not. You remember? Be angry, but sin not. Do not let the sun go down on your anger. Here are these elements of understanding that the forgiveness, the promise, it's a covenant that you're making with God, saying, I'm not gonna throw this in their face because it's, I'm just gonna focus on the, the, the immense debt that I came into this relationship with. I'm gonna focus on that. I'm gonna look at the grace. I'm gonna look at the, the, the renewal. I'm gonna look at the redemption and the reconciliation that you've given to me that I did not deserve so that I can keep in covenant with this promise and not continue to throw it back at the person that just cost me a week's wage in this eternity of life that you've given. Number two, I promise not to bring it up with others. I'm telling you, this is probably the most disastrous thing that we have going on in the body of Christ within relationships. And this is our marital transaction is that we, we turn it to prayer or gossip or whatever you wanna call it. But the reality is that you are continuing to make other people aware of the wrong that somebody has done to you. I am not saying that it's inappropriate to bring people into that place of process that are trustable, righteous, and that can help you through it. Those are really righteous people that need to be in that place. If you've been hurt, offended, you're processing and you don't have the maturity in Christ right now and you need help on the path forward beyond what you know or understand, absolutely bring that person that you can trust into this and say, and I pray that if you are that person holding them accountable, that you would pray with them, that you don't get caught up in the lie, you don't get caught up in the emotion of it or just the offense and and help them focus to the cross. Help Help them focus to the justice that it brings. And just say, let's confront this after the internal part of our heart is healed. Let's confront this so that we're looking for the restoration. Because do we not, anybody here is married to a spouse you wanna see in hell? Anybody? Just wondering. I mean, think about what I just said. Anybody wanna send their spouse to hell? Anybody wanna send a friend? Anybody that's sitting next to you or maybe 10 seats over and that's why you're not close to them? I don't know. The idea though is, I mean, I I can spend all my time trying to process and entrap them in the direction that is hell bound, or I can continue to bring them back and focus to what God has honored and has given in redemption and say, a heaven bound, I want to honor what he has given to me in grace and give them the same grace, give them the same mercy, give them the same cleansing blood that washed me clean over the circumstances and situations that I've faced. And I've faced a lot of situations and I've done wrong on so many levels. My own heart is open to repentance. I've hurt so many people. I've offended so many. If you haven't got to know me, first thing is usually offense. I'm just gonna say, <laughs> these are the realities that we deal with, you know, cause we're human. We're, uh, I'm more than human, I guess, but the, these are just different ways in which we pattern in our life. But I will tell you, Impression without expression in a grace-given way causes depression. Some of you are holding on to so much. And like I said, you're like a wandering soul, a mindless, reckless mind 
that is caught up in the past of things that happened that are repressed that now have become a life of deceit. And it's time to bring the truth. It says the truth shall set you free. Let us find the truth in the word of God. Let us find the truth in the situations. It is really hard if you have an eight-year-old mind, 12-year-old mind, and you're 40, 50 years old trying to think back to that thing which anchored you and has held you bound in pattern. But I tell you, the spirit of God can walk you through moments and he can show you where he was at in that moment. And even without a full acknowledgement of, of laying out facts, God can work on the emotion of the heart, that area that felt the way it did, God can replace it with the opposite spirit and help you with that response by his Holy Spirit and bring comfort. We need that. We've, have we all been through a few things in our life that might be been hard a little bit and in relationship, maybe some broken struggles that, uh, that kind of affect us as well as offend us and now we're easily triggered by it? Here's the third one. I think uh, probably the most important, if not the first, promise to not keep bringing it up into myself. <laughs> How many dwell on these things? Have a hard time sleeping. Restless minds. You just can't let it go. And this is where the real battle begins internally in the mind is if you've been offended, you've been hurt, and I, I pray that we can give you the pattern to enforce that prayer is mighty. And you just bring it before the heavenly father and say, man, this is so hard to deal with right now. My mind is just captured by hatred or offense or betrayal. And I just want to give it to you, God. I don't know what it looks like on the other side of this emotion, but I would rather give it to you. And some, some of us need just some practical ways to do that. Worship, expression of song. David Sheet sends me songs and I know that the, there is workouts and I can tell that he's lifting more based upon the songs he sends me because they're a little bit more... <laughs> There's other times that seem like more peaceful workouts. But... <laughs> But I mean, you can spend your time and focus on God. Turn it towards worship, turn it towards prayer. Oftentimes, if we try to turn it towards prayer in thought, it's a little bit hard if your entire life and heart and mind is consumed in those thoughts. So start with that place, that gateway that says, Lord, just turn on a song and just say, Lord, I just, I thank you. I praise you anywhere. These are great songs because it's like, I'm gonna praise you in the midst of the storm. I'm gonna praise you in the midst of my trial. I'm gonna praise you in the offenses, uh, the divorce, the hardships, the, the broken relationships with family, the broken relationships with parents and spouses or broken relationships with your family members or the church you once went to or the last four that you went to. And if that's you, let's, let's talk. Um, <laughs> these are the things that we need to address and deal with. Do we agree together? I want to grow in God. I don't want to be holding on to burdens. I want to grow internally by the will of God. I want to have a sharpened focus uh, and a sensitivity to his spirit that I am not dwelling on the offenses of others, but on the glory and the presence of God. And I'll tell you, there is nothing more distracting than being the victim of your own life. You need to turn your heart towards victory and give that place of victory to God and just say, I thank you that no matter what comes my way, it's because of you, God, that I've overcome. And I can't overcome this, I surrender to you because I can't overcome this on my own. Oftentimes, in the patterns of our relationships, we get to a place where the only thing that comes out of our mouth is the negative of not what they just did, but all the things they did before that just triggered in a memory. Because remember when you argued over the butter that last time? That wasn't the reason. That's what we see, right? It's just that last thing. I, or, uh, no, I won't. <laughs> I'm learning. I'm giving it to God. I'm not going to bring up anything we did. <laughs> These are great days ahead of us, but I'm gonna be honest with you with a, a real warning sign. These are gonna be hard days ahead of us. And if possible, even the elite would fall away. Why? Because we are so consumed with self and we are so overcome by everything that's happening around us because we have lost focus on what matters most. We are at war. I no longer am at war with God. My flesh is at war with him. Mm -hmm. 
and I want to win that battle. And I believe it. many of us in this room, it starts with forgiveness. Many of us in this room need to learn how to forgive. And I'm telling you that the truth of what God's word says is for your benefit, as I am finding, that if I hold on to these offenses, I don't become a better man. I'm not more righteous. I'm not upholding a righteous standard by holding offense, by the way. Yeah. I used to think that. I, I, I used to hold against the offense of the whole institution. If they taught wrong, did wrong, did something wrong as, as somebody that's gonna be in the place that I'm in right now, then by, by golly, I'm gonna hold them accountable to it in my mind and my heart and tell other people about it. Oh, but that's right. Those are the three things, yeah, all of them. Holding it in myself, dwelling on it, telling others about it, none of that works. True forgiveness is, man, the grace of God has paid a debt that you and I cannot pay. And as it was said yesterday, he has overpaid a thousandfold by the purity of his blood that cleanses us. And I do not want to uh, betray that and blaspheme his name. I do not want to uh, undervalue the redemption of the work of Christ Jesus in my life or for yours. It is important to me that you recognize that the truth of God exists solely between the relationship you have with him, the resource that he gives to you. And let the spirit of God, as we said, pour your spirit out. Let him pour his spirit out in you. Would you bow your hearts and heads with me today? Lord, I don't know if this message is a warning for some, if it's refreshing to hear, if it's hard to hear and convicting, but I know that, Lord, you're at work. I know that you are in more than capable to do more than what can be said from here. It's your work by your spirit internally in the hearts of each and every individual here. Lord, we can learn from these lessons. Trials are going to come in many kinds, but we consider it pure joy. For those lessons are teaching us, redeeming, and they are helping us grow into the maturity and character that you have for us. Lord, let us evidence in our life that we love your word, that we will live by your word, that we will honor your word for us. God, if there is somebody here in this place that has held on to offense, even with somebody else, make it right, Lord. Help them make it right. Give them the power to make it right. Lord, I just pray for a revealing light by your spirit today through this week where we have held on to things that are inappropriate, waiting for the merit of change. I pray that unmerited grace that is given to us today would be what, it would be our anchor, holding us in the midst of this world as a storm. And we would allow for your faithfulness to speak and to reveal to us that which you desire for us to be obedient and change. Awaken our hearts, Lord, so that we can grow developed in relationship to you. Just take a moment right now. We don't want to move forward without just giving honor to God by just asking him, God, is there any offense in me that I need to address? Let the conviction of your spirit lead us to righteousness. Show us where sin has entered into our heart. The most effective way that I have found to overcome unforgiveness in my heart is to pray for the individual. Whenever I have that dwelling thought that comes, I just say, Father God, I pray for, and you just, Fill in that blank and you begin, Lord, I just pray blessing, redemption, give them the grace you've given me. It begins to change your attitude towards them. Maybe that's what you need to do today. Take a moment just to say, God, I don't wanna hold this. You might think you're 10 years away from that divorce. You might think you're five years away from that person or, or long and far enough away that it doesn't affect you anymore. I'm telling you, it's still there. It's rooted in the heart needs to be pulled out. Just because it's not on your mind doesn't mean it's not in your heart. So Spirit of God, continue to just bring that to the surface so that we can address these things, so that we can live free as you have removed the shackles from our life, from our heart, Lord. That's what we desire. We no longer 
desire ourself. We no longer desire our own will. We no longer desire our own way. We want to give to your way. Heavenly Father, help us. And for those, Lord, that in maturity can help me, to those that can be a cleansing process of, of encouragement, Lord, strengthen them in this body that they can help lead to a better day, a better way forward, reminding of the counsel of your spirit, reminding of the counsel of your word, that we can help one another grow in our heavenly precious name of the one who died for all this to be changed, Jesus Christ. We say, amen.